the big political controversy of this week. I spent a lot of time in Parliament this week and that's because Parliament finally passed the bill, certainly the House of Commons passed the bill anyway, to get those flights off the ground to Rwanda. I was at Downing Street on Thursday. You may know I'm the chief political commentator of this station as well and Rishi Sunak was taking questions but the one he couldn't answer was when those flights would take off. Another big question is what is going to happen in regard to the House of Lords. Uh, we'll get the very latest on that. Peter Lilly, uh, Lord uh, Lilly is with us. He's a Conservative member of the House of Lords, former Secretary of State, of course. Uh, Lord Lilly, thank you very much indeed for joining us this morning. Pleasure. What will happen? What's the mechanics of this, Lord Lilly? Well, how long will it take in the House of Lords? When will they start? They'll start debating it. I think there's, an, there's a, 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 on Monday, there's a, a piece of legislation that is related to this that starts. So it really starts immediately, doesn't it? That's right. On Monday, there's a, a debate about the treaty between Britain and Rwanda. And a wrecking amendment has been put down by uh, former um, Attorney General, former law lord, uh, Peter Goldsmith, I think, uh, to uh, say that we shouldn't um, implement the treaty or... Impl I, I haven't actually, actually read the details of his memo yet, but I, that we shouldn't go ahead with the Rwanda policy uh, until all the measures that the uh, government's proposed and that the original Supreme Court wanted have been certified as in place. In other words, it's trying to move the thing into the long grass. If that's defeated, uh, or e even if that's passed, it's not legally binding. So the government doesn't have to abide by that. But it might influence how courts uh, subsequently legislate, oh, you know, rule on things. Mm. Uh, but if that's either defeated or the government ignores it, we shall go to the second reading um, some days later, uh, which is a debate in principle. Uh, and it's unusual for the House of Lords to even have a vote at that stage because inevitably what has come to it has been approved by the elected house so it'd be very wrong for the unelected house of lords to reject it out of hand and, and is it right lord lily sorry to interrupt you is it right that no. labor usually don't uh, vote things down that the house of commons have put through labor in the house of lords that's sort of the convention here could we see any change to that or is that likely to continue to be the case well they haven't declared their hand so far i've asked individual labor members and get rather mixed views as to what they propose but you're right in general uh, the Labour Party and no may well nor the Conservative parties would not uh, oppose something which has been approved by the House of Commons the sole job and power of the House of Lords is to propose amendments and to ask the House of Commons to think again if we amend the bill uh, and the probably will be amendments passed by the House of Lords even though I won't support them uh, they will go back to the House of Commons. The House of Commons can consider those amendments. It can accept them. It can alter them further. It can reject them. Uh, but the House of Lords would be very, very wrong and actually risking committing suicide if it were to go beyond its power of asking the Commons to think again and try and block legislation until the election. Who are the? I know this is. A, I want to get your your personal views on this plan in a minute or two. You said that you, obviously you don't want you wouldn't be supporting various amendments and so on. I want to I want to prove that in a second. But I just want to ask you first who the troublemakers are likely to be with this. You've mentioned Peter Goldsmith, Lord Goldsmith. There, I would imagine the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, will have quite a lot to say about this as well. Uh, who are the sort of leading lights in the House of Lords who you think will be uh, will be causing most pro most pro most problems for Rishi Sunak? But rather to my surprise, Lord Carlyle, who I often don't agree with him, but he's normally uh, a very sensible and reasonable person, was the government's um, uh, sort of uh, chief lead on uh, legislation on um, uh, um, terrorism. Terrorism, yes. Lord, uh, yeah. Yeah, he Lord said Carlyle, on yeah. the radio, on, on one of the worst interviews I've ever heard him give, that he would... That they, or could lead to totalitarianism and therefore the House of Lords would be justified in trying to stop it. Uh, and I was rather surprised he should say that. I think that it's an absurd position to take and a constitutionally very dangerous position to take. But there are an awful lot of lawyers who set themselves up as thinking that they know better than the what the law should be. 
rather than how it should be applied. Al although is... you could argue, I suppose, that the Supreme Court did rule a lot of this unlawful a few months ago and they're the highest court in this land. Well, they're the highest court in interpreting the law, but they don't make the law. So they've ruled that it's not safe. The government have introduced changes and now asked Parliament to declare that in the opinion of Parliament, it is safe and Parliament is the ultimate maker of law. Courts interpret and apply the law, but Parliament makes the law. And if it says, as a matter of law, uh, Rwanda is acceptably safe, then that is the law and the courts will have to follow that. And do you think that should be the case? Well, tell us about your personal views on this, Lord Lilly. Yes, I think so. Uh, the problem was that the uh, Supreme Court it found itself bound or thought it was bound by a ruling of the European Court of Human Rights that in assessing whether or not uh, the state, any state, has the right to uh, send uh, a, an asylum seeker away uh, to Rwanda or back to their own country, they must only take into account the interests of that asylum seeker, not of the general population. And I think it arose when uh, a continental country wanted to expel someone who was involved in terrorism and they did it because they wanted their country to be free of terrorists uh, but the ECHR said tough you have to ignore the rights of your own citizens and only give priority to the rights of asylum seekers now that's wrong and Parliament should say very explicitly that that's wrong that we're not going to abide by such judgments and ultimately uh, the supreme good is the good of the general population of course we should not be cruel or uh, you know do anything uh, untoward towards people who are seeking genuinely seeking asylum but if we've got reasons to send them abroad one of the reasons is to deter people coming across the channel do you think, do you think this legislation does that do you think there is a deterrent there um, there there are people who are risking their lives we've seen of course this week very sad deaths of five migrants in the channel. I mean, if they're willing to risk their lives, surely being sent to Rwanda isn't that even that much of a deterrent, some would argue, Lord Lilly. Uh, well, I think it probably would be, because why risk your life to get sent to Rwanda? You might well risk your life to come to the uh, United Kingdom, where you know from the people that have preceded you, you'll get a good job. If you have uh, any difficulties initially, you'll be supported by the taxpayer. You'll find housing and have something to live on. Uh, and uh, ultimately, Britain is a very attractive country. And most people want to come here, actually, as economic migrants, not because of political persecution. Uh, they won't want to go to Rwanda, primarily as economic migrants. And so given the choice of staying in France or going to Rwanda, they'll stay in France. Lord Lilly, thank you very, very much indeed. Just as a final point on this, Lord Lilly, I just want to ask you, um, I mean, how, how, do you think flights will take off before the election in terms of what happens in the House of Lords when it goes back to the House of Commons? When, when could this actually become law when a bill becomes an act? When do you think that might happen, hypothetically? Well, the bill can become an act quite quickly. The problem will then be whether the courts, despite the limits on their role in the bill, uh, find excuses and ways to drag people off flights and delay the flights. Uh, I fear that that will happen. I hope I'm wrong. I hope the government is right in being optimistic that the courts won't be able to do that. Uh, but if there are all sorts of injunctions in European court and uh, if the Attorney General foolishly says that we must abide by such injunctions even though we never agreed to hand over the right to the European Court of uh, Human Rights to issue injunctions on things before they've even heard a case, um, then things could, there could be no flats getting off before the next election. Uh, I think that would be very sad. Uh, that's why so, if so I've been even if this legislation passes, Lord Lilly, you still think there could be many, many roadblocks that come up, including from the European Court of Human Rights, potentially, because we have this idea, the Section 39 idea, that, that civil servants could be told to actually defy that. I mean, some people would say that's, that's the rule of law, that, that's what we've signed up to. You mentioned the injunctions there, of course, and that's a, a very, very valid point, but um, surely you would say that you yourself are very much a rule of law man. I am, but we originally signed up to the European Court of Human Rights. We didn't give it the right to impose injunctions. It took it upon itself to give itself such, and that's, that's this uh, Rule 39 business. 
they passed Rule 39, wrote it themselves and said that they could give uh, injunctions. Well, uh, I think we should, uh, well, we, we are by law saying that uh, the government doesn't have to abide by such injunctions. And what Parliament says is the law. Uh, and that therefore will give pa uh, the power to ministers to stop that. It would be very sad if the Attorney General were to overrule that. I've, I've had arguments with the Attorney General over the rule of law in the past. Uh, and lo and behold, the Attorney General changed his mind in mm. those days. Mm. Rule of law changed because of my arguments. I'm not a lawyer. So it's a very flexible and fluid thing is what international law is. Uh, and it's very subjective. And the lawyers relish their subjective right to tell us all what the law is. But very often they're making it up. Lord Lilly, thank you very much indeed for your thoughts this morning. Really appreciate that.